Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Randall Maxey with the Black Health Trust and we're coming to you with our regular Sunday program. And we have wonderful guest speakers this morning uh, who is Dr. Despani. And we're gonna talk about a number of things that are on the horizon uh, that we're concerned about. So I'm very fortunate to be actually broadcasting. I'm in the beautiful island of Jamaica, West Indies at Montego Bay. And it is absolutely beautiful. There was a conference of region one of the National Medical Association. And uh, I had a conversation with the current president of the National Medical Association, Dr. Rachel Villanueva. And uh, I told her she is a fashion model as well as a brilliant, brilliant clinician and leader of our medical association. And I had an encounter with Dr. Lisa Dawes, who was able to address some medical issues of people attending uh, the conference. And we actually had uh, physicians show up here positive and symptomatic from COVID. So go figure that out. So our main topic today is to discuss the issue of uh, monkeypox, but I understand there are a host of other issues uh, with the coronavirus and other infectious diseases. So without uh, further ado, I'm going to ask Simon to show the first slides, and I want to give a little introduction before we turn it over to Dr. Uh, Despanning. And I'm going to be asking questions also of Dr. Jordan, since a lot of this is very relevant to what he does. So uh, there's a journal we get almost daily called the MedPage. And in their discussion of monkeypox, next slide, please. According to the Center for Infectious Disease Research, there are at least 226 cases of monkeypox that have been recently identified in 21 countries, including the United States, Canada, and countries in Europe. Next slide, please. Uh, so what distinguishes these cases, all of which are outside the endemic region of the virus, is that person-to-person -person transmission is occurring. With the majority of the cases seemingly unlinked to travel from an endemic country. And the endemic countries are on the continent of Africa. The appearance of multiple, but as yet unlinked clusters is concerning. This suggests that there's, there are undetected chains of transmission uh, that have been occurring. Next slide. So the CDC noted that there is a theoretical risk of airborne transmission of monkeypox. It is mainly however spread from close contact with the skin or fluid of infected persons. In the past, the most consistent source of transmission was through contact with animals. More recent cases uh, seem to be congregated among men who have sex with men, or MSN. Many new infections are being diagnosed in uh, clinics where they look at uh, sexually transmitted illnesses. Next slide. The incubation period of the virus ranges from five to 21 days with contagious risks occurring when symptoms begin. The mortality risk from the infection ranges from one to 10%, depending on the availability of medical resources to detect and treat. Next slide. So patients with new onset febrile illness 
and rash should be evaluated for monkeypox. The presence of lymph adenopathy or swollen lymph nodes, usually under your mandible, neck, under your arms, is a warning sign. The top clues with monkeypox are rash, fever, and swollen lymph nodes. Attention should also be paid to lesions uh, as well as a social history uh, due to the proportion of men uh, having sex with men. Next slide. Now, the rashes usually start in the mouth, move to the face, in the body in a centrifugal pattern, and a PCR test of skin lesions and fluid can confirm the diagnosis. A high suspicion of infection uh, warrants you to do testing. Next slide. So there are a number of antivirals that have been suggested that can be used uh, uh, to treat, but there's no current standard of care treatment as of yet. Next slide. And these are some other antivirals. I'm gonna leave that to Dr. Despani and Dr. Jordan to discuss these. Next slide. So in terms of preventing, uh, there are some smallpox vaccines that can be indicated uh, and FDA has approved for treatment of monkeypox. There's some older generations of medications that I'm going to leave that to our discussion. Next slide. So we know that clinicians who administer either a vaccine after, right after a infection can shorten the duration and severity of the illness. But before we go on, I'd like to get the input. We have a resident genius, uh, Dr. Jordan Despani, who's a uh, PhD. He also has a degree in pharmacy, pharmacology. And even though he is a top-rate scientist, he wants to be on Wall Street. So before he goes to Wall Street, we want to connect with him to tell us about not only the viruses uh, that are associated with smallpox and therefore monkeypox, but there are other things that are coming on the horizon uh, that he uh, told me about the other night when we talked. Dr. Spani, thanks for coming on the program. What's your take on all this scare about monkeypox? Um. The, it ties basically back to something I had said earlier that um, if in a world where um, you know everyone isn't protected, then no one is ultimately safe because this is something that has obviously been endemic to Africa uh, for most of its history, um, but it's only been uh, like regionalized, if you will, because the chains of transmission were more uh, circumscribed. So for instance, it's typically been in like West Africa, but even in 2018, Nigeria was reporting its first few cases, but no one really cared about the fact that um, monkeypox was spreading in Nigeria. And now Nigerian virologists are saying, hey, see, like, we've been battling this and you guys didn't help us. And these are the consequences because now everyone is freaking out because it actually is you know, spreading. Again, the numbers I've seen have been 200 to 400. Uh, cases, uh, 200 being the minima, 400 being the maxima, uh, across over 20 countries. And yeah, now it's a huge problem now that it's supposedly going into the, um, you know, Western world. Um, but again, the problem is that at the end of the day, we're all humans, right? You know, we're 99.8% alike. So again, if you don't stamp out a pathogen, you know, like when it first arises, it becomes immeasurably more difficult to, you know, break the chain of transmission or even like the cycle, right? Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Dr. Walsh, how you doing, man? Can you make sure Dr. Walsh? Yeah, there, there we go. I think I'm I think I'm unmuted now. Doing well, Dr. Maxi. How are you? I'm doing excellent, man. I'm down in Jamaica. 
You yeah. know what, Dr. Maxey, this is why we love you because you never flaunt your good fortune on anybody else. Dr. Despani <laughs> and I just appreciate you not rubbing it in our faces exactly. that you are down in Jamaica for the long weekend. Well, I'm um, here to test it out for you guys. So, so Dr. Maxey, your, your slide presentation uh, uh, scared me enough. And now Dr. Despani, as he always does, is uh, scaring me some more. Um, so my thoughts, my thoughts about monkeypox are, uh, Dr. Despani, as usual, is 100% right. We, we here in, in America, that does not include you today, Dr. Maxey, we here in America tend to not, not worry about things until they're you know, on um, some street in Manhattan or on Wilshire Boulevard in LA or something like that. Suddenly, now it's a problem and we should do something about it. Um, it's good to know that Dr. Despani and those like him are out there keeping an eye on this all the time. And I just think we need to pay more attention listening to them. Yeah. Go ahead, Dr. Despani. Oh, yeah. The, the problem, though, is that we're now entering a zeitgeist where it's kind of like a, um, instead of bring your own beer, it's like choose your own truth <laughs> adventure. So uh, <laughs> that's the you know reality of things. But, you know, I do want to uh, obviously, you know, having all this knowledge and whatnot, it's useless if it can't be um, you know, spoken to in a language that everyone can easily understand to steal something from a former POTUS. So, um, yeah, like I, you know, I obviously opened the floor to dialectical dialogue on things. Cause you know, for instance, one thing that Dr. Maxi asked me before, um, uh, before he, you know, asked me to participate in this is that like, so where does this monkey pox come from? And even though it's called monkey pox, for instance, um, you know, like it's those poor monkeys are, you know, falsely being blamed when the reality is that they suffer, you know, like all of these deleterious effects, including, you know, like developing the pustules and so forth and so on, just the same like humans, because again, like there is at least over 90% uh, similarity between, you know, like say mon monkeys like chimpanzees and great apes uh, and humans, you know, as much as people, you know, refuse to acknowledge that. But um, yeah, the reality is that we don't know like what the vector like that carries the viruses, but most likely it's some type of rodent. Because again, if you go back, uh, you know, in history, not far history, recent history, in 2003, there was an outbreak of monkeypox, and it basically was being transmitted via, you know, like rodents that have been imported uh, here in the U.S. And what's interesting is that now um, those who have uh, any cases of monkeypox right now in the U.S., they're being told to completely uh, eliminate or exterminate or extirpate whatever you know term for execution you wish to use or um, euthanize these uh, any like hamsters or you know mice or uh, rats that they might have as pets because that's most likely the uh, the definitive host but again it's kind of like the same thing with uh, SARS coronavirus 2 where you know we are always you know suspecting that it's uh, the like that, uh, but then we're always confused about oh, was the intermediate host like because again it's a cycle right it goes and through all these different animals right so so yeah so the whole thing is that monkeys suffer just as much as us they're not their originators and so forth and so on so well let me ask you a question and this is not humorous but you're talking about rodent pets but many of us live in areas where rats are a part of everyday life, uninvited. And uh, I sort of live in a semi-rural area and, you know, admittedly, I have rats and we have, to have pest control. What, what, other than pets, how do you handle things like that? And how much of a risk are they? I mean, rats are, you know, like, rats are like bats and uh, armadillos in terms of being like vectors that just carry such a myriad of diseases. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that's tough because at the end of the day, right, they're everywhere and how do you eliminate all of them? And again, most of the time they are asymptomatic carriers um, of these, you know, pathogens and yeah, they're like transmitting things. And the, I mean, to solve it, I, what you're asking for is like a very tall task because believe it or not, um, in, um, I'm blanking on what the time period was, but Australia, 
has tried many attempts at like eliminating all sorts of things. Like they tried to uh, use uh, a rabbit myxoma virus, which is another type of orthopox virus, uh, in order to cull the rabbit population in Australia. And it did not do anything um, due to the laws of natural, not laws, but the you know theories of natural selection. Um, and yeah, we're just not really good at uh, culling um, any like animal species and that is part and parcel of the problem right because it's the same thing too with SARS coronavirus too that this infects humans but it also infects um like cats tigers deer etc and then once it becomes endemic not just in a human population but in an animal population it's nigh on impossible to contain um the spread so so i mean right now we're in we're like a uh, I guess a precipice here and that we can potentially stop um, this monkey box um, outbreak. We did it in 2003, but, you know, we do have to be very uh, assiduous about this. So, so Dr. Dr. Maxi, let me take your, your question in a slightly different direction. Um, I, I have, I have been to your house and um, you do not have a rat infestation at your house. Um, the area where you, where you live is, rural, as you said. And so you are going to have things that live outside. They're just outside. But going back to my time as the health officer in Washington, D.C., D.C., like many other cities, I, I used to live in L.A., and I don't know whether the rats are bigger in L.A. or bigger in D.C., but they're big both places. And yep. the way that we uh, tried to intervene as the health officer was to make sure that folks were trying to eliminate the way that they would feed and breed so we, we began to, as a, as, a, as a district, we began to buy certain kinds of trash containers that they couldn't get into because they are really good at getting into regular trash cans. We began to clean up places where people would leave things, um, parks where folks are leave, going to a picnic and leaving all the food out after they leave, right? So I think that for a lot of our, our viewers and our participants, uh, being in touch with your local health authority about what they're doing in your jurisdiction in, or in your area to take care of areas where rodents grow. The other thing that people don't think about is anytime there's new construction and you start to excavate, you're going to dig up places where rodents live. And so preparing for that, if somebody is gonna build a, an apartment building near you or put up new housing near you, you should be aware that those permits that they get need to include some sort of a regulation around how they're going to handle any rodents that are that are disturbed because um, that's when they can wind up in your house when you uh, mess up the place where they're currently living. Excellent point, excellent point. Uh, Dr. Dr. Jordan has his hand up, Dr. Maxson. Dr. Jordan? Hi, you know, I treated well over 10,000 people with smallpox in India. Ethiopia, but mostly India. You cannot look at a patient who has monkeypox and smallpox and differentiate. You can differentiate because if a human has monkeypox, he is not as sick. Smallpox killed people. Those big lesions were so painful, people could not move to drink water or do anything period, but we always had them. My concern now, one, my generation, Dr. Max, your generation, we were vaccinated against smallpox. I don't know if we still have any immunity or not, but young people, Dr. Walter's generation was not. So that, there's now two or three generations of people who are not vaccinated against any of these at all. Wait a minute. Dr. That is the first point. Are you, we, are you calling Dr. Walt young? Well, he's younger than me. That much I know. <laughs> and I, and go, I think that's go ahead, Dr. Jordan. Just the keep whole going, population is not immune. First, Secondly, if I took someone who had monkeypox to a random number of primary care physicians, I'm gonna say 95% would not diagnose it. 
period. It, it's, we didn't see that much monkeypox then. We haven't seen that much monkeypox. We haven't seen that much chickenpox, but we haven't seen monkeypox since smallpox was eradicated. But I'm finding strange about this whole thing. Why are we seeing all of a sudden this increasing number, particularly among homosexual men? That becomes two problems because just like if you go back to HIV, most doctors were, particularly black doctors, we were so uncomfortable dealing with the MSM. That's why we called it men having sex with men. People were totally uncomfortable dealing with the issue, asking persons personal questions. <laughs> I mean, we weren't comfortable, Randall, and you know it. You were in the end of it. You were in the enemy then. You know, Phil Smith tried to kick me. Well, he kicked me in that butt and I nearly threw his ass off the stage. I mean, that was where we began as professionals dealing with AIDS. And I don't think we have come much further since then. Uh, but we need to look at at least making sure our doctors, if they get a case, because the issue is, if there's no case in DC, go to sleep, don't worry. But if there is a case, there are gonna be cases. If there's a case in LA, there are gonna be cases. And we need to know what we need to do, what we need to do to make sure that our doctors then know what to do. And I don't think most of us have the ink idea of what to do if someone came in with a case of monkeypox. Yeah. Let me ask Dr. Uh, Despanic. In terms of what Dr. Jordan is speaking about and what I basically read about transmission, uh, it looks like there's only a theoretical chance of airborne transmission, but transmission so far seems to be from personal human touch, whether it's sexual or asexual or whatnot. What are the issues around that, Dr. Spanning? That's a tough thing because as mammals, we you know like show our prosocial like impulses by you know touching right, um, and like obviously touch is I don't know is integral. Um, so that's really what's going on uh, at the end of the day, right? Like there is some fluid, if there's any type of fluid transfer during that touching, whether it be like kissing or, you know, like you know, mucosal to mucosal contact or so forth and so on, then you'll have, you know, like those like pustules and so forth and so on, like, you know, have that fluid and then it'll transmit across to the person, right? But um, one thing that I'm seeing in the media is that it's being vilified solely as a disease that affects like uh, MSM. And while that might constitute the bulk of cases that it's not exclusively um, a virus transmitted, you know, among MSMs, right? There are, you know, heterosexual individuals that are getting this again, because it's, you know, touches so integral to pro-social interaction. And it's, you know, I, as an analog, I always reference um, HHV5, which is human herpes virus 5, which is also known as cytomegalovirus. Uh, and cytomegalovirus is one of the most successful um, like um, viruses and intracellular parasites of all time, because, um, you know, it basically is transmitted through, again, like, you know, kissing, you know, like your, you know, like baby child or what have you. And because of that type of transfer, it infects about 90% of the world's population. So it's the same thing. But I mean, what plays to our strengths as um, humans is the fact that um, unlike an RNA virus, like say influenza virus or um, uh, coronaviruses, that this is actually a DNA virus. So it's not as likely to mutate randomly. Like all of the sequencing studies I've seen have indicated that, it, you know, it's pretty, you know, highly conserved, um, like in terms of any like, you know, mutations or changes um, relative to like the West African clay um, from which it originated. So, so that's. Well, we have a saying we coined for months and months, common sense. Mm -hmm. If I were to meet a super fine movie star, and I'm married, so I'm not going to meet one. And she looks good, but she's got open sores and rashes all over her body. Why would I 
try to be close to that and have personal contact. But I'll let, let Dr. Walks put that into psychiatric lingo. But I would think- Let me ask something first, because if you met that person who was good looking, et cetera, you wouldn't meet her on First Street. You'd meet her at the park at 10 o'clock at night and you wouldn't see the sores. And that's okay. how it is spread MSM. It's poetic. You'd go to a bathhouse, you'd go to the park, you'd go to a club. And the places you go, you'd be able to have intimate sexual contact and you wouldn't know they had one sore. So, so, good point. So let me, so without, without responding directly to what you just said, uh, Dr. Jordan, uh, what I've read about monkeypox is that we should absolutely not assume that monkeypox is in any way limited to men who have sex with men. And so we need to be aware of the fact that a lot of things are spread a lot of ways. And where I thought you were going with the common sense uh, comment, Dr. Maxey, is that we spread a lot of things amongst each other. And we don't know whether the thing that we may be getting close to is something that can hurt us or kill us or hurt people in our family, especially in our broader family that may have some immunocompromised people. So exactly. I think that's, and, and I'm glad Dr. Dr. Hines is on because um, getting that family practice doc perspective is important because folks are going to come to, to, uh, to a doctor like Dr. Hines or a nurse practitioner with whatever they come in with. And I think there are some common sense principles, whether, whether the movie star is fine or not, whether it's 10 o'clock at night at the park or wherever you are, I think there are some common sense principles. And if we focus on monkeypox in particular, monkeypox is, is not, and Dr. Despani, feel free to interrupt and correct me anytime. Monkeypox is not being transmitted the same way that, for example, coronavirus is being transmitted. And so there does need to be some contact either with the person or with the fluid, but you can have bed sheets. Um, they're, they're, you, know, you, you really do need to be thoughtful and use common sense when we're looking at how things are spread from one person to another. Can I okay. ask Dr. Hines to jump in with that, with that family practice piece? Yeah, can I just, before she does, one thing that has come to my mind about this whole issue of coronavirus and whatnot, there's an old saying in the Bible that cleanliness is next to godliness. And if we don't know anything else, we know that we gotta be cleaner than we have been and more observant than we have been and not all this freedom. But Dr. Hines, please jump in. Thank you for coming. Dr. Hines? There she yeah, is. sorry, thank you. I was trying to get off mute. Um, as it relates to, so like, like many viral illnesses, monkeypox doesn't start with profound rash, right? Like there's an incubation period um, that's usually somewhere between five to 14 days. And oftentimes what comes before the rash is gonna be things like fever, fatigue, um, in, uh, increase in the size of lymph nodes, and then the rash comes. I think similar to, in, but that's also very similar to like coronavirus. And part of the thing is, to your point about cleanliness is, if you're not feeling well, as the person who's not feeling well, take time to respect the fact that something's off, something's not right, even if you don't necessarily know what it is or where it's going. Um, it, you could make the argument that monkeypox, similar to lots of other things, when there is an outward appearance that other people can see, how could you have ignored that, right? Why would you go, why would you go into this scenario and have intimate contact with somebody who outwardly has, you know, a rash, pus draining from something, any of those kinds of things, when the reality is lots of times, in most circumstances, people aren't at that spot when, when transmission and incubation is, is, is occurring, similar to COVID, right? Lots of times people are, are transmitting COVID before they've realized that they have COVID or before they've realized that that scratchy throat that they thought might've been allergies away, that's really something else. Um, and I think the take home message, one, one 
people had monkeypox last year. It just wasn't to this level, right? But one of the things that I think scientists and Dr. Despani, you can comment on this too, is post COVID, we have a lot of viruses that are not behaving in the same way that we have historically known them um, to behave. And I, and, I, and I think the take home message is rather than try to identify single, single viruses that are gonna make you change something is if you're not feeling well, be to yourself if you can until you kind of figure out where things are at. That's, that's the only reasonable thing that reasonable people can do. Yeah, and I mean, just to, you know, like parlay off of that, like look, look just even at the avatar that Dr. Gibson has, for instance, like the, you know, like the masked gentleman. So the reality is that people should have learned from the social experiment that, you know, we've been through since like, you know, 2020 that, hey, like, like a mask is not, you know, like something bad, right? You know, like this is a barrier that like provides protection. And the whole thing is like, we're not going to go back to an era where there's like mass, um, you know, like uh, like social distancing where everything is getting closed down. But, you know, at least that experience like should have, you know, inculcated that mindset in everyone that, hey, you know, if I'm not feeling well, yeah, like I'm going to stay in, like I'm going to take my, you know, like uh, PTO, right? Granted, there are, you know, socioeconomic conditions where certain people cannot do those things, but if they can, then they, they should. And again, that's where you have like the, um, you know, like the, I guess, social aspects of medicine come into play because, you know, like more of our population is disproportionately like, you know, on the side of not being able to take the time off in order to take care of their their health so again that's the problem because it's not solely just uh, a matter of you know like the microbiology or molecular biology but it also is like the social sides which dr waltz can speak to more eloquently than i very good very good so my concern that is brought home to me by this episode of monkeypox is that we're moving into an area where we all should have been uh, more cognizant that we have to be more careful than we might have been in days past. We're living in a, an age of more pathogens, uh, more susceptibility. And when we first started the Black Health Trust, we talked about cleanliness, washing your hands, wearing gloves, wearing masks, but we can add to that, be observant. And also there's a social responsibility, not just to yourself, but it has, has been, been mentioned. If you have something, see something, say something, don't just ignore what signs of illness you may have, but realize they might spread to people that you love and hurt them. And so there's a double responsibility that we need to have for the people that we love and people that we're around. And uh, some of the things I've seen people do are rather criminal, at least I consider them criminal with some of this non-mask wearing and closed enclosed spaces. And uh, we just have to protect ourselves. And I think we may be in many cases more vulnerable than some things that are out there. And I don't doubt that there's some geopolitical things that are behind some of the things that are being said and going on, but I won't go down that track at this point. Dr. Walks, Sir. where are we at now and what are you thinking? I am, I am thinking, Dr. Maxey, that several things at once. One of the things I'm thinking is that we are getting further and further away from agreeing on what's true and agreeing on what is appropriate for people to do. And that runs the gamut from viruses to firearms. We are just, we are, it, and I'm, when I say we, I'm, I'm speaking specifically about in the United States. I know our, our dear friend and colleague, Dr. Kerwin Dawes is on, and, and I'm surprised she hasn't put you out of Jamaica yet, but I'm sure she'll get to it as soon as we finish up today. <laughs> but there, there's this, this whole notion of, of variable truth or my truth and your truth that I think is a problem. On top of that, Dr. Maxey, I know we talk about common sense and I know we talk about 
all of the ways to stay safe and everything Dr. Despani tells us about how viruses spread is absolutely on point. And at the same time, people wanna get back together again. We've had a few years now of the pandemic and people are trying to meet in restaurants and people are trying to gather um, in, in places where they can talk and they can laugh while they eat. And we know that there's a difference between having a low level conversation and having your mouth open laughing and, and eating in front of other people and how much more challenging that can be with respect to protecting ourselves. Which to get back to your question about what am I thinking, it makes me think how much more important it is that we get back to what Dr. Hines said. I don't think we're gonna get people to come out of their camps on I'm not wearing a mask, I'm wearing a mask. I think people are hardening their stances on that. I'm getting vaccinated, I'm not getting vaccinated. I think people are, are hardening their stance on that. I think what we can ask people to do is to be, go ahead, be selfish, but take care of you. Think about whether that scratchy throat is something that you should keep from other people. Think about whether or not that little lump under your, under your, your, your chin you know, is something you should pay attention to. Maybe that runny nose is not only allergies. I think if we help people to understand that they can care for themselves better if they take notice of whatever's going on around them, I think that may be a good way for us to add to the common sense instructions that we, that we give people. And one last thing I'll say is, don't be afraid to assertively protect yourself. I was on an airplane a couple of weeks ago and there was a woman sitting a row in front of me on the aisle. It's one of those planes with two seats on each side. And she was coughing and blowing her nose and coughing again and blowing her nose and didn't have a mask on. The woman sitting in the window seat, now the doors are closed, the plane is getting ready to take off. The woman in the window seat just got up and climbed over her and went to the front of the plane to talk to the flight attendant and got a seat someplace else. So I'm not saying climb over people on the airplane, but I'm saying if somebody is looking like they might be able to make you sick and they don't care, be assertive in protecting yourself and make sure that people know that you're not gonna just sit there and let them put you at risk because they don't care about their health and they don't care about your health. You care about your health. I 100% endorse that. Dr. Spanning, now we've talked a bit about monkeypox, but I know you expressed concern about there's some other things out there that we need to continue to watch and be observant of. Can you tell us about some of those issues yes. that are still there? Yes. Uh, and um, before I do that, I do want to um, also like mention, like if everyone sees in the uh, comment section that Dr. Johnson um, is uh, like just further iterating like what I had said earlier, namely that the like there's a lot of travel from Nigeria to the US and vice versa, owing to the fact that Nigeria is the most populous country in Africa, right? And the problem is that the monkeypox outbreak there was going on since 2018. That's four years and nobody, you know, like really cared until, you know, now it's, you know, like every everywhere, right? So this is something that could have been and, you know, of an outbreak that could have been killed in the cradle, really. Um, but again, like that really means that we have to be more together, right? I mean, like you just look at the far demogra demographics of how human society will evolve. And like the reality is that by 2100, actually, I, um, the continent of Africa will account for most of the like geoeconomic growth in that because again, like the uh, demographics are that they're the youngest population in the world as a continent. And like, you know, so the whole thing is like, let's be focusing on Africa and helping it rise to the fore like now, right? So that's, you know, one thing instead of, you know, like, you know, being at loggerheads and just, oh, we're just going to close everything out and whatnot. But now to your second point about uh, what Before other things- Before you go that, on, are you yes. politely saying that it matters who gets affected by the virus before we pay attention to it? Yes, yes. And the problem is that due to a history of racism, the reality is that certain peoples and ethnic groups are denigrated and, you know, like just viewed as though, oh, you know, like 
they have these like strange, you know, like viruses and, you know, like, uh, you know, parasitic infections, like, you know, plasmodium and, you know, which causes malaria. So it's like, oh, okay, that's normal for them. Like case in point. And that's where I had, you know, um, I, you know, was discussing a little earlier with Dr. Uh, Jordan is that there's an, uh, like a intersection between um, the, like a homophobia with, you know, I'm just focusing solely on the MSMs because then that, you know, makes that cast everybody who is heterosexual, who has or develops uh, monkeypox with an aspersion, like, hmm, you know, I don't really trust you, right? And then, you know, like the, you know, that's always been a, a problem, right? Uh, and then secondly, is the fact that whenever, it, just look at the media and you see the images of monkeypox and how come they're like, if this is in 20, more than 20 countries, how come all of the images are, of, you know, those who have more eumelanin, you know, like the, the polymer that makes our skin, you know, dark? Why is it only African individuals whose skin is shown and put on display, like some type of strange circus or carnival, like saying like, oh, this is what monkeypox is and whatnot? Like, no, 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 no. Like, you know, if this is, you know, the first case in America, like occurred in Massachusetts, like, show that, you know, show, you know, like someone that has lighter, you know, like you, you melanin levels and whatnot, like to show, like to really hammer home that this is something that can infect anybody, unless I'm mistaken. And, you know, like not everybody is actually a, a homo sapien sapien, but, you know, to the best of my knowledge, everyone is homo sapien sapien. So again, like that's the like intersection between like homophobia and like racism that is really hindering uh, full throated and response to this, like, you know, virus monkeypox so it's you know we go on to your other points about yes the other thing um that uh needs to be you know like paid attention to is um what's going on with children right there are these pediatric cases of uh hepatitis that are just like fulminant where you know kids who are like you know like what eight ten and whatnot are just coming in with advanced staged like hepatitis, right? And you're just like, oh, okay, like what, what is going on? And for most of the like scientific evidence is pointing to um, adenovirus um, uh, 41F. Now, what's interesting about, you know, adenoviruses is that these are, you know, normal denizens of the viral world that typically cause like, you know, colds and uh, our stomach pains and whatnot. And what's striking is that we have more than 100 cases of like hepatitis in kids, and some of these kids are dying, uh, but it's by uh, an adenovirus that typically causes stomach like problems and in, intestinal distress. So, where the scientific community is at a loss is like, how did this, you know, like, you know, how did it develop these other, um, you know, like, off target toxicities. Um, and yeah, it's, we're at a loss. I mean, the one thing that can def definitively be ruled out is that it's not a result of these kids getting uh, vaccinated. That is definitely not that. And, but interestingly enough, only a, approximately like 20% of uh, cases of these children who like have uh, this hepatitis with uh, adenovirus 41F, like also have. COVID. So, you know, we're really at a, at a loss. Um, and again, adenoviruses are DNA based, so they don't evolve as rapidly as an RNA virus. So that's something that bears, um, you know, keeping in mind because this is, you know, also going on. And then thirdly, um, keep in mind that we're actually still in the uh, SARS coronavirus 2 pandemic. I mean, a lot of people are, you know, they're just like, I'm done with it. This is, you know, eaten up too much of my life. But the reality is that um, you, know, you may be done with the virus, but the virus is not done with you. And what we're seeing is that um, the coronavirus is evolving such that it's taking that path I mentioned in earlier talks, wherein the virus can't shock and awe, you know, like an immunonaive population. So what it's doing now is it's becoming more of a chameleonic shapeshifter and saying like, oh, 
you have antibodies against, um, you know, like the stuff that my cousins, my SARS coronavirus two cousins have. Well, okay, I'll just, you know, like evolve like cool new like features that you're not gonna recognize. You know, like the doorman at the door will not know I'm even SARS coronavirus two anymore. And one of those is a um, is a uh, mutation I had, you know, spent a lot of time uh, ringing the alarm bells on in an earlier um, BHT uh, program, namely L452R. This is something that I was uh, acutely like uh, aware of and warning about precisely because that is one of the key uh, mutations that's capable of allowing like that immune evasion because no longer can your um, like your antibodies recognize like that hey like this is something that I defeated the before I will defeat it again no it's like I'm you know like invisible you know like I'm invisible man or something now um, and that L four fifty two R point mutation is actually becoming um, a part of every single like, coronavirus that's causing a problem. So right now uh, in the United States, we're at the point where uh, we have Omicron. The Omicron lineage is you know, predominant, but it's further bifurcating. So, uh, and this is going on um, mainly right now in the, on the East Coast of the US, but there's BA-112, um, and then another sub lineage, BA-1, 12, one, um, and again, these are all Omicron, but yeah, I mean, they're just, uh, or these are virus, the viruses are focused on finding ways to evade, you know, your uh, immune response. Meanwhile, um, there's also BA4 and BA5, which are again, they're another part of the Omicron family tree, uh, but they are considered to be about 20 to 25 percent more infectious than say you know the BA1 or BA2 um, which BA1 is the Omicron variant that like you know exploded uh, in around December January and then BA2 kind of you know had its um, heyday um, in the spring of this year um, but the reality is that this is just going to keep happening uh, unfortunately and like BA4 and BA5 is actually causing a wave uh, another wave in South Africa and as you guys all remember from one of my earlier talks like South Africa has had the misfortune of also uh, playing host to you know other like particular uh, variants and whatnot so uh, yeah I mean the reality is that the virus use this as an evolutionary arms race or a chess match. And the thing is that we are kind of like uh, rage quitting, which is like, I guess, a millennial or Gen Z term for like just taking your video game controller and just tossing it away. And the virus is like, cool, well, you didn't turn off the system. So I'm still going to play the game and I'm going to win. Because what we're seeing is that even though we have these, even though we have these, the problem is that we are not maintaining like records, you know, like we're not surveilling this and putting this in like, you know, a public repository. So really it's like a choose your own adventure of like, hey, you know, like I feel sick, you know, like, you know, but I'm going to stay home and I'm going to take the test and so forth and so on. And they're not report, like people are not reporting, you know, like they have the infections and whatnot. So we're actually in a fifth wave right now in the United States, but because we don't have that, um, very precise data, we are kind of like shooting, you know, blindly in the dark, uh, with the exception of being able to use wastewater um, surveil surveillance. So um, the reality is, unfortunately, there will most likely be more waves to come, especially if BA4 and BA5 uh, become, you know, grow exponentially because they have been identified uh, not only here, um, but also even in China, because uh, right now the People's Republic of China is trying to maintain a zero COVID policy, which unfortunately will probably not work because how do you, you know, stop a virus that just keeps mutating and mutating? But at the same time, the reason why the leadership and, um, and, uh, you know, like Zong Neng Hai, which is like, you know, kind of like the main compound in, um, in China that corresponds to the White House uh, here, is that they fear that they would lose, say, probably 10 million lives. That's 10 million people that would die if uh, they dropped the zero COVID uh, policy. So even though it seems backwards and deleterious, like what uh, the PRC is doing for its social science, you know, like, you know, managing like the scientific and the social sides of things, they stand to lose a great many people. Um, so, so yeah. Dr. Spani and Dr. Walks and Dr. Hand and Dr. Jordan, what do we do? What are you suggesting we need to do? 
we we see what you're saying about what's coming, but what new systems do we need to put in place? We're talking about how do we provide more protection and information to our communities based on what you said, what things do we need to address better? I so, think- So, so, so Dr. Despani, be, before you, you go on to the what do we do, a couple of more points about the where we are. Um, there are a couple of, of, of questions and points in the, in the chat about the level of infection, infectivity or how easily transmissible some of the new variants are. Um, and, and let me just say, I, I, I would never know if I had variant B this or C that because nobody's gonna take my test and, 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 and check it. So I guess the question is, we watch the news and we hear that this variant has become more predominant and that kind of thing. So what we don't often hear is, is this new variant more infectious than the other or is it more deadly or less deadly than the other? And then the second point, because I want you to hit both of them, is you held up the rapid test. I have those at my house too. <laughs> the question is, as we get more variants, are those tests still good at this point? Yeah, and that actually parlays off of what Dr. Uh, Gibson as well as Dr. Johnson uh, have uh, indicated. Uh, so to the uh, first question, the one of the bright spots is that the virus is, you know, like more focused on just evading our uh, immune uh, response. But at the same time, that is not being correlated in the data with an increase in mortality rates. So people are not dying at the same rates, which is a net win, but the virus is, you know, just still infecting. So that's the, you know, I guess, crux that we're at, where a lot of people are saying like, okay, this is something that we can like live with because if, you know, a certain number of people aren't dying, which again, like the fact that people are even dying and the fact that we've crossed the, that 1 million, um, you know, like, uh, Americans who are now the cease threshold is horrific, but some people have kind of like just turned off the light and saying like, oh, okay, you know, well, people die due to like car accidents and things like that. So they treat it like that, which, you know, this is something that, you know, we want to have more preventable deaths, right? But the reality um, is that each variant is like far more infectious. And usually it's like a 20% increase for every new variant that, um, that comes out due to, or not comes out, but, you know, like, uh, managed to, you know, outcompete its uh, relatives. And the reason why is that's just the nature of natural selection where, you know, like the sh survival of the fittest, only the strong shall survive. Now, and to the second uh, point regarding like how accurate are those tests, um, they will still tell you like if you have like an infection, right? But those tests are not, you know, like the gold standard, like, you know, quantitative, uh, you know, ver reverse transcriptase. Uh, PCR, which is QRT PCR for short, um, will we'll tell you like, oh, you know, like you have this variant, you have that variant and whatnot. It's just going to be like, yeah, you have that um, you know, infection mainly because it's trying to use, you know, like this, the spike protein and, you know, all of these um, like sars cov virus 2 variants per force must have, you know, like a spike protein and a nucleocapsid, um, you know, protein and like a membrane protein, because that's intrinsically part of, you know, like what makes them, you know, like a, a RNA, like coronavirus, right? So it will still like identify, but the reality is that we still need to like at the individual level, just be focused on, you know, like taking all the skills that we have gathered during this tumultuous time and putting them into practice while on the like uh, pharmaceutical and industrial side, there needs to be a focus on developing um, like multivalent uh, vaccine. So, so one last one last question, Dr. Despani. Um, I've and I always come come to you as my fact checker. I get the truth from you. So, what I've heard is that the PCR test is not really the best test to know if you have a, a current infection or if you're infectious because you can have had the infection, you're no longer infectious, but your PCR is still positive. Whereas, if you want to know that you are currently infectious, that the rapid test, the one you held up is the way to go. 
Can you clarify that for us? Because a lot of times people I talk to, they don't know. They're rushing out trying to find a PCR test because they don't trust the rapid test. No, no. I mean, the, the PCR test like is the gold standard and whatnot. But like the thing is that at the end of the day, right, there still needs to be more studies that are done in order, like if you want to determine like, oh, I have this variant, I have that variant and whatnot. What was interesting about some of the earlier um, Omicron variants is that they had like a telltale um, like deletion that allowed uh, it to be de 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 deduced whether it actually was uh, an Omicron variant just from that uh, PCR as long, uh, alone. But the reality is that, yeah, you really won't know what type of variant that you have, but you know, all the same, like, those rapid tests will, you know, like again, give you a yes, no. And with regards to the PCR like test, you know, even if you do that, right, because of these new variants and whatnot, it, it won't tell you like, oh, you have like, you know, BA, you know, one, you know, like 12, one, you have BA4, et cetera, et cetera. Because again, you know, things move on. But yeah, I mean, like if you really need to get those like, you know, re like results like quickly, yeah, like have like the, the rapid test, but again, have multiple because the thing is that you can't just really take, you know, like one like snapshot and then, you know, assume that it's the entire movie, right? It's the difference between like looking at a scene in a movie um, versus, you know, having seen the entire movie and being able to give a thoughtful critique of it, right? And that's the same thing that a person needs to consider, right? That, you know, you need to test on multiple days, right? Um, you know, and yeah, really at the same, same time, same thing with like the PCR. But, you know, people, you know, sometimes kind of just want to know where they are at that snapshot in time. And that's not like enough, right? Because again, there always is like an incubation period. And then, you know, like period where you're shedding virus and then, eventually, you know, goes away. So it's a, it's a time course, right? Sorry, sorry, Dr. Maxi. When, when, you know, whenever I have access to Dr. Despani, you know, I'm going to just jump right in there, get all that good information, just soak it up. That's okay. So we're talking about some of the things that are on the horizon that we still need to be concerned about. And what can we do better, not only as a Black Health Trust, but as a, a nation, and as public health individuals, and I know we have Dr. Rhonda Johnson on, we have Dr. Lisa Dawes on, as well as, uh, and, and let me just say this, I, I am so proud of Dr. Walks, who was a director of public health for the entire District of Columbia. And in that position, he was advisor to, I don't know about kings, but definitely presidents and secretaries of health. And uh, Dr. Johnson Hines, who is a, uh, family practitioner who runs a society in uh, Maryland. So we've got some really cool people to comment on some of these issues. So first crack is yours, Dr. Despani. What's coming down the pike and what do we need to do better? The, yeah, there are going to be more uh, variants. Um, you know, that's the reality. But at the end of the day, we need to learn to like we didn't learn to stop the virus when we could, so we need to learn to live with it. But living with it means that we need to be more um, perspicacious or thoughtful about how we go about, you know, our lives. And, you know, one of those entails, um, you know, like just being sure to get like the boosters and things like that. Because the one thing that we're seeing is that as we go from, you know, like the first uh, dose, second dose, and then to like boosters, like the number of people who, uh, you know, like, have done those things actually drops, if I'm not mistaken. We haven't even crossed, crossed the 50% threshold for people who've gotten the booster shot. Um, so that's something that, you know, again, you're, you're trying to, you know, build your fortress, right? You're trying to protect and defend your castle, right? And like, what better way to do that than to be protected? Because again, like the, you're, it's not like a one and done where you get these and then that's it because your immunity wanes over time to these. It's the same story with influenza viruses, right? It's the reason why we need to get flu shots, you know, every year. And it's increasingly becoming the understanding that that will also be the case with coronaviruses. And one thing that people might understand uh, intrinsically is that there, because there's so many influenza viruses circulating, you need to have like a multivalent shot, a shot that gives you like, you know, like 
two uh, influenza A's and two influenza B's for your body to train itself against. And that is will increasingly become the likelihood, um, you know, moving forward where we're probably going to have like, you know, some multivalent, you know, that protects against the original uh, or that combines like an Omicron uh, variant with the original Wuhan um, you know, parent virus uh, in a uh, shot. So that's kind of where I see things uh, moving forward. And then uh, just to the uh, like questions that uh, were asked by uh, Dr. Sherrod and uh, Dr. Gibson, uh, with regards to the, like when the PCR rapid tests are administered, um, I, I think any time that you suspect uh, that you have an infection and whatnot, because again, the earlier you can identify it, like the better, because then you can immediately like self-isolate before you start to exhibit those uh, symptoms or shedding virus and whatnot. And then, you know, through the entire course until the virus stops shedding, which, you know, typically should be like across the course of like, you know, the, like about 10 days and whatnot, you know, like you'll probably like test positive for it, but it's better to engage in prophylaxis, AKA prevention. And, you know, I, I think, you know, like I, you know, like may have been exposed at this or that, like I might want to get, you know, like uh, tested just, just to, you know, be safe. It's better to be safe than sorry. Right. Because, you know, it's much easier to like stop something uh, or rather it's easier to prevent something to stop it once it's already ongoing. And then for Dr. Uh, Sherrod, um, regards to the um, test for antibodies, um, I would say that this is kind of moving more into like the quantified self type of uh, idea where um, I, you know, would just, if I had to use a simple heuristic, I would say, hey, if you're three or four months out and you're eligible for like a um, like second booster, and right now it's only, the second booster is only approved for those 50 uh, years of age or older, like then go get that three, four months. That's your, uh, like your antibodies have probably waned. But no, I mean, I think having more data is more helpful, right? I mean, it's the same reason why I'm the type of person where I actually, I was one of the first people to actually get my, um, my like SNP a single nucleotide polymorphism genetic testing done when 23andMe offered it so that I could know things about how my genes, you know, like influence like what I like to eat or like, you know, what health risk that I have and whatnot. So again, the reality is that as a um, ethnic group that, you know, has like had, you know, like a lot of things like put on top of us, like one way that we can break out of like the pile that's been put on top of us to prevent us from realizing who and what we are is by grabbing knowledge, you know, by, you know, like the hand and then taking it, you know, because really like evidence and data are like twin swords uh, that can be used to cut down falsehood and we should use those you know, everything at your disposal, right? Because we're disproportionately impacted, you know, by like these, uh, like SARS coronavirus two and these other like um, uh, socio, like medical uh, problems. So we should be, you know, like foremost and, you know, taking charge of our own like health and knowing, you know, our, our, our bodies. Um, and um, I can't speak yet to the uh, data indicating side effects of like the multiple boosters. Uh, um, I, with the, you know, with the exception that, again, whenever you're like testing, like, you know, anything, and then, you know, like putting that into like, uh, I guess the population across like, you know, millions and millions and billions of people, the reality is that there will always be some subset that will, you know, have some type of reaction. And this is something that like, it's not just solely with messenger RNA viruses, right? The thing is that with like monkeypox and smallpox, like, so the, the monkeypox, like there's no monkeypox vaccine, but there actually um, is some cross reactivity between the, um, the gyneos. Um, so that, so between. I think we can hear you for a minute. You're you're on mute, Dr. Despani. Oh, yeah. So, sorry about that. Um, the uh, so yeah. So with the so there are two right, current vaccines um, for uh, the smallpox, right? And the interesting thing is that like uh, that uh, the Gyneos vaccine actually has eighty five percent cross reactivity um, to you know like potentially like halt a uh, monkeypox um, you know like 
uh, infection and whatnot. But, you know, like that's superior to like the Janssen uh, vaccine, which I believe that's the ACAM 2000, which is like an older, older uh, vaccine. And like the reason why that isn't like really used, even though we've stockpiled hundreds of millions of uh, uh you know, like doses of the this ACAM 2000 is because it also causes like all of these like horrible effects and it's not really um, safe for those who are immunocompromised. So, you know, again, like scientists, you know, are mindful of these things and that's why they try to develop, you know, better things. But at the end of the day, right, there will be some, you know, like, like I guess react, reactivity and so forth and so on that happens at like those large scales. And that's part and parcel of why say the FDA does conduct phase four clinical trials where even after the drug is approved, right? It is being monitored in the population. And then if something, you know, is like really, you know, off then, you know, it gets pulled from the market like thalidomide, for instance, thalidomide was FDA approved but it was only later discovered that it, it caused like uh, birth defects uh, in women because it was actually used for uh, treating morning sickness and you know they had to be put in the market so keep in mind that there are mechanisms in place you know to ensure that this is not deleterious um you know on a large scale yes, um, thank you. uh thank do you see that we will get a booster uh do you see that we will get a booster for COVID more than once a year uh should we be trying to get a booster every month six months i mean the reality is that that probably like that was the thought process like maybe like last year or year before last but at some point there actually is a period beyond which like getting like consistently boosted and whatnot like that gives diminishing returns unless your immune system is you know like not the best right because as you get older your thymus which is an organ in your uh, throat uh, that which is it produces T cells that is growing smaller and smaller it actually is at its biggest um, you know probably like I'd say it reaches its zenith uh, when you're 20 and then afterwards it starts to like uh, grow smaller and smaller. Uh, so like knowing that, then you can kind of figure like, okay, for older people, yes, they probably need to be uh, boosted and whatnot because their like, uh, T cells and their immune system like writ large are just not as you know, like well, you know, like prepared due to the immunosenescence, but you know, like for younger people and whatnot, yeah, I don't think that it would make sense to like, you know, administer like, you know, every six months, every six months and every six months, but like yearly, you know, like that could be something that, you know, people come to consensus on in the community. Mm -hmm. Dr. Hines, you got any thoughts? I would say there's, in, in the context of what can we do, there are systemic things that can be done and then there are still like individual things that people can do. And I think that one of the things that came up earlier is that that space where you want to rage against this whole process and be like, forget it. Like I'm not doing any of this, right? Re resist the urge to have that response. The, the, the space where you continue to actually wash your hands for the legitimate period of time that hand washing should take place. There's nothing wrong with that, right? We can certainly go, there's nothing wrong with wiping down communal surfaces that you're gonna be using that other people have touched. There's nothing wrong with continuing to be vigilant about who you're around, how close you let the people that you're around get into your intimate spaces um, and, and those types of things. There are certainly things like, like as Dr. Despani was saying, like there are things that are happening at a systemic level, but then there's still individual choices that we have. And I think that's a place where um, you can still feel empowered, right? Because while you don't need to dictate what other people are doing, you may wish that everybody on the plane or everybody in the store had, you know, chose your method of protection, whatever that is, but that's not your choice. But what is your choice is how you choose to conduct yourself, where you're willing to go, not willing to go. What, what sounds right to your gut? Does this, you know, that does this space in the current of whatever is your community transition level, I, I'm in Maryland, Maryland, and in particular, my county has high community transmission right now. Um, so there are choices of things that I might engage in um, at a time when we're in lower community transmission than what I would choose to engage in now with a dispersed group of people. Um, those are the types. Of oh, we just lost Dr. Hines. Okay. Um, hopefully she'll come back uh, 
And I saw Dr. Dawes. Is Dr. Dawes still on? I'd like you to comment on what we can do better. And then I want to, we're getting close to the end of the program. There's a slide I want to show. Dr. Kerbin Dawes, my I hero see, here. I see Dr. Dawes is on. If we can get her unmuted. And she's not going to throw me off the island yet. <laughs> as, as we know, Dr. Dawes is often busy doing doctor stuff and has to, there she is. Hello, Dr. Dawes. Hi, I was just here relaxing out here, also in Jamaica, and listening to you guys more than commenting on what we can do right now. So I will just continue to listen for today. But okay. I am listening to you guys. And I told you you're my personal hero. <laughs> you're mine as well. Actually, all of you guys are doing a great job. No, well, thank you. Um, I want to, uh, Dr. Hines, were, were you, are you back on? Dr. Hines is back yes, on. Yes, I'm here. I'm not sorry when you lost me. Sorry. Okay, you were finishing up some comments. I'm not exactly sure when I dropped off, but I was just simply saying that one of the things that we can do in the current times is be mindful about where we are in your community. So, for example, in my community now, my county is a high transmission county. There are things that I just have to look at and say, does that make sense for me and my family at the current time to engage in? The answer for some of those things is no. Um, and that then that answer may not necessarily be the same answer when we're in a space of low community transmission. And the point is you have individual efficacy, um, even if systemically things aren't moving in a way that necessarily you agree with, you'd still have some individual efficacy. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Rhonda Johnson. Can you impart some of your thoughts for a second before we close down? Uh, Dr. Johnson needs to be unmuted. There we go. Hello, I don't have anything to add today. Thank you. Okay. All right, uh, Simon, can you pull up uh, those two slides I want to show? I think it starts with number six. Uh, so go, 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 go down one more. Go to the next slide. Okay, keep go, go down more. I'm, I'm not getting the slide I want. No, go, go back up then, I'm sorry. I'll let you know when you get there. Go ahead. Okay, so I gave a talk yesterday and we have troubles with all of this infections, but there's uh, some stuff that's going on in the background that is causing a significant health risk that sometimes we forget. And that's cardiovascular disease. Go to the next slide. I'm just gonna show a couple of things. Keep going to the next slide. Go to the next slide. And go to the next slide. And I think we go one more. Again, one more. Okay, this is the one I wanna show. And the JNC defined high blood pressure, hypertension, that your blood pressure should be less than 120 over 80. And even though we all know that, both doctors and patients, we take a lot of liberties. We know that elevated blood pressure is the 120 to 129, and it should be less than 90. We know that high blood pressure is defined as 130 and above. And we know that a hypertensive crisis is defined as 140 and above, but those numbers look so normal. And many of our patients see our own physicians and physicians of other cultures and say, well, the, your pressure is, is normal. It's only 140, it's only 150. But go to the next slide. There were a number of trials 
in the 2000s, one called the SPRINT trial. And it showed that treatment of blood pressure is recommended to 120 over 80. And when you bring blood pressure to 120 over 80, it reduces the cardiovascular disease outcomes, including stroke, reducing it 35 to 40%, Myocardial infarctions reduced 15 to 25%, and heart failure up to 64%. And I'm reminded that when we bring that pressure into that level, we're saving more than 9 million lives per year. And I'm saying this that even though I'm extremely concerned about infectious diseases, there are some things that we do ordinarily and accept that blood pressure of 140 as normal, but that's knocking us off like flies. And I just want to comment on this a few minutes and invite some input. Not only do we need to be clean, not only do we need to resist, you can take them down, Simon. Uh, do we need to be concerned about infection, but how we live our everyday life with diet, with being consistent with medications, if we need to take them, of seeing our physicians, if we need to see them. We just need to be very aware that there's some little things like 10 millimeters of increase in blood pressure can lead to a 35% increase in having a stroke. And the reason I know that it happened to me and that's very personal. And so I just wanna bring people's attention to that and invite a few more comments from some of our advisors on to plead for people to really pay attention to your numbers. And I know Dr. Walks asked me a few weeks ago about should your blood pressure be elevated after you work out? Yes, for a very short period of time. But if you're really controlled, it will return to normal within a few moments. So we have to be concerned. I'd like to invite some comment from our experts who are on the phone, because I'm, I'm extremely concerned that we concentrate on just coronavirus and monkeypox, but not know that eating that piece of bacon can mess up the rest of your life. Dr. Walsh. Uh, doc, Dr. Jordan has his hand up, Dr. Maxey, and I'll, I'll uh, save my comments. Dr. Jordan? You know, it's interesting that our two stars in infectious disease are Dr. Jordan Despani and Dr. Wilbur Jordan. There's a connection there. Dr. Wilbur Jordan? Can we, can we get Dr. Jordan uh, unmuted? You're still on mute. Oh, there you go. Go ahead, Dr. Jordan. Okay, I'm unmuted. Thanks. No, uh, I agree with what Randall is saying. Uh, he knows my cardiologist, Mason Weiss, and I'm having an angio this Thursday for that very reason. So I think it's important that we are aware of our whole body and the heart and brain are totally important. And we've got to make damn sure we keep it functioning at the right level. So I'm thankful that he said that. Thank you, Dr. Jordan. Dr. Weiss is my cardiologist. So as a group, I hope we would also do things to be more networked. So if something happens like with monkeypox, we're fine. Now, I have a mailing list of most of the primary care doctors around King, because I give an HIV STD update every year. We need to be able to reach out to providers so they will know what to do if something happens. And you know, let me give Dr. Wilbur Jordan his kudos. Dr. Jordan knows more about HIV than the CDC and all these other infectious disease people put together. And I'm gonna hope that he will come to us one Sunday in the future and give us an update on what's going on with HIV. I mean, if you go to his lectures, not only his, does he give you extreme information, but he have you falling out of your chair too with his comments. But 
this lady who Walensky, who heads up CDC, needs to come to class with Dr. Jordan. She, he can teach her. But thanks, Dr. Jordan, for being with us. Thank you. Uh, so Dr. Dr. Despani, uh, I think, wants to be un unmuted. I think I Here we go. To, yeah, I just wanted to be mindful. Yes, yeah. You know, I always, you know, like I'm like a student at the feet of Dr. Jordan. Um, the with regards to you know taking care of our bodies and whatnot, this is something that actually like is I, a topic of you know just hobby chatting between myself and Dr. Gibson. Actually, just you know, like eating healthy doesn't have to be a chore. Uh, rather, it's about, you know, like just going on a path of self-discovery and seeing what you like and what you don't like. I mean, I think on many of our like Wednesday night talks uh, um, and even, you know, like now you see me always sipping from like something and it's just me, you know, taking on the hobby of, um, you know, collecting teas and trying teas and like just having tea unsweetened and whatnot, of course. Um, and, you know, just with the, the plant itself is you know, it's healthy, it's beneficial, right? It can actually, you know, like benefit oneself. And, you know, doing other things too, like instead of um, eating, you know, like unhealthy foods, like maybe try, you know, venture outside of your comfort zone instead of white rice, which, you know, like it can cause like a very high, you know, like uh, glycemia or rather high glycemic index uh, food because it's just empty carbohydrates. Instead, maybe try to venture on the wild side, try, um, tasting or having like black rice or red rice, you know, like, you know, you'll be surprised by like how, you know, like nutty it tastes, you know, and at the same time, like it actually contains, you know, the whole, you know, like brand germ, et cetera, et cetera. So you're, you know, getting something that's healthier. Um, and, you know, same thing too, like, for instance, I also collect extra virgin olive oils. Like that's, you know, much more beneficial than say, you know, like just doing like canola oil or things like that. So there are things that we can all do. Um, but the reality is that you're, it's really almost like a, uh, like a bank account or like, a, you know, I say like a 401k or a, um, or a Roth IRA, right? Where you put in a certain amount of money, but you don't expect, you know, to like pull it out like what the next day or like just during market turmoil, rather you're putting in and you're you know, like adding more more money in and you're letting it compound and grow. And it, that should be the same strategy or mindset applied to like one's health where you're like eating these healthy foods and you're compounding, you're turning it into a habit and a habit that compounds daily and daily and daily is what leads to a healthy lifespan. So, no, thank point. you very much. Dr. Walker, we're almost at the end of where we uh, need to be with our time. I just got another notice that 21 minutes ago, there were six people killed in Lawndale, which is about five minutes from where I live. Mm. This gun violence is, it's always been bad, but it seems like it may be accelerating. But if you and Dr. Hines have final words, we should move on and wish everybody a good Sunday, Dr. Hines and then Dr. Waltz. So I will just say that one of the comments in there about, in the chat was about why do so many doctors, um, I'm going to paraphrase, get kind of complacent about blood pressure. Um, and I would say as a primary care doctor, lots of times what happens is you're starting from numbers sometimes that are so high. It's the similar, and you see this happen with diabetes and other um, disease. You're starting with numbers that are so high that when you make significant strides and you're already on three and four medications, getting all the way to the goal can sometimes, you 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 get a little, I don't know another word other than complacent because you know where we came from, right? It's like when the goal is to try to lose 300 pounds and the person's lost 150 pounds, you get excited about the, the, the 150 pounds, even though there's still another 150 to go. And it's not an excuse. It's just in, in, the, in the question on why, I think that's kind of where things sometimes can peter out. The other thing I liked about Dr. Despani's comment um, is about nutrition and the goal of being um, thoughtful and, and inclusive about your nutrition. One of the things that I like to say is it's not just the drastic changes, but small changes can, can change your life, right? So if the small changes I'm going to add, I'm going to add water to my diet, or I'm just going to, you know, 
in the, in the context of the example that was used with bacon. If I eat bacon every day, can I go back down? Can I go down to two or three times a day? Small changes matter too. It's not just the, the lifestyle overhauls that, that, that make a difference. And, and sometimes starting somewhere will give you the momentum that you need to get to your goal. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hines. Always, always practical, good family doctor advice. We, we need that. We spend way too much time with, with little specialty things. Um, let me say this, Dr. Maxey, in keeping with my, my comment just now about, about practical broad things, I am one of those people that has driven through Del Taco and ordered the macho combo and thought because I was getting a Diet Coke that made everything okay. Or because I'm drinking water with my uh, triple bacon cheeseburger, that makes it all right. We have to think comprehensively about our vitamin D level and about whether we are you know, getting our fish oil or whatever else it is that we have gotten together with somebody smart like Dr. Jordan or Dr. Despani and understood what's a comprehensive plan for long life. Uh, we used to talk about being lifelong learners when I sat on the Board of Education. We want people to be lifelong learners about health. And what that means is that stuff they told me in medical school, now it may have been 100 years ago, but they told me that when you're dealing with blood pressure, you want to take uh, the person's age plus 100. And that was a good number. Well, I think that's fine if you're 20. But when you get to be 70 and 80 years old, you don't want your blood pressure to be 180 over anything. And so I think that we want to be lifelong learners as we have exposure to practical advice from people like Dr. Hines. We want to be lifelong learners when we, when we get good advice about how to interact with the different parts of our healthcare system, like we get from Dr. Gibson about reaching out to your pharmacist. We want to be able to be lifelong learners about health because I promise you, you may feel great at 35 and do whatever you want, but 65 and 75 are coming for you if you're lucky. And if you haven't prepared for 75 at 35 and 45, 75 is not a lot of fun and neither is 85. So I just wanna encourage all of us to be lifelong learners about health and what was true when you're 20 may not be appropriate for you or even true anymore when you're 50 or 60. That's what I got, Dr. Maxine. Well, thank you very much. And uh, my affirmation, as soon as I leave Jamaica, I'm gonna make some flaxseed and uh, smoothies along with chia seed smoothies. And I'm taking my meat consumption down 95% but not until I leave Jamaica tomorrow. Everybody have a great Sunday. Be safe and be smart. Thank you for Dr. Despani being our guest and Dr. Walks and Dr. Hines being with us and hello to Dr. Nabert, uh, who's attended a graduation somewhere in the Midwest. Have a good day, everyone. Good day, everyone. Bye. Thanks, I'm going to take care of everything so well.